And here we are, there's big interest in Alberta and the oil and gas industry as we head into a federal election. What's the impact of the policies that have been out there for so long? And what are the currents, political and environmental, surrounding this industry? Well, I have with me two people who have been long associated with that industry in Alberta, Sue Rose and Mike Rose. Welcome to you both. So we're going to start with you. Uh, this is a very, very wide question. What's the difference in the economic and political atmosphere uh, when you early got interested in this terrain, the oil and gas industry, and what you've seen since, if there are differences? Oh, there's a lot of differences, that's for sure. So I have a little bit of a unique, unique perspective coming at it as a young girl mm -hmm. getting into the industry. I actually thought that this was an industry that was doing a lot of good for the world. You know, we were bringing energy, you could sort of see what uh, the possibilities were if you could get energy across the globe. And, uh, you know, young girls always want to do something good with yeah. their careers. And uh, I think that feels a lot different now. You know, you, people wonder why women aren't going into our industry uh, now, why we have trouble filling the pipeline of executive management with women and, and even frankly boards with women and, and uh, you know it starts it's a pipeline issue and it's because there's a little bit of an inherent um, negative to what we're doing you know not not recognizing that what we're doing is actually really for for the good of society. Before I jump to my just expand on that you said a little bit of a negative isn't there a whole lot of a negative? There's a whole lot of a negative a whole lot of a negative. And what, yeah. what, what constitutes that negative? I think as my career progressed, it was not in, in the early days at all, and really it's been the last five to seven years, it's, it's just been oppressive, actually. It's an oppressive negative that, um, that is trying to paint our industry as evil, and, and really we are getting better and better at delivering cleaner energy uh, and we want to take it further uh, to the globe, and, and we're being stopped. One more for yourself. When you do take steps to make it better, uh, when you accommodate the new thinking, some of the new thinking, about uh, the development of oil and gas, when you do improve safety or, sa safety or cleanliness standards, do you ever get feedback and credit you ever have someone who was criticizing you before, oh, we actually now we've done these things, come back and say, hey, good on you? No, it's never enough. It's never enough. And, and that's okay. I mean, we're wanting to be continuously better. And I think as an, as an industry and, and individuals, people within our industry, uh, we actually do want to be better and better. We do want to produce an ever cleaner molecule. It's not just what we're hearing from the outside driving it. It's we know we can we can do things that are uh, improving the product that we're delivering. And that's technology. I mean, it's exciting. It's fun to be part of that. But no, we, we get very little recognition, actually, and very little uh, recognition that technology is actually playing a huge role. Like we, we've often uh, reflected, I think, internally that uh, the technology that drives our industry, um, even when I started in our industry, you know, 30 plus years ago now, uh, the technology that we have is so much different than what yeah. we were using in day one. And, and so that's in every aspect, not just in how we're yeah, getting understood. oil and gas out of the ground, but it's in how we're, um, you know, our footprint, our, our, um, our emissions, our, our emissions are far lower. Our, our uh, land footprint is massively lower. Uh, and that's all technology. And so recognition that technology is uh, driving that ever, mm -hmm. ever improvement is... Um, yeah, very little on that. And the voices are just getting louder and louder and louder about uh, something that, quite frankly, I think is a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. I'll put the first question to you, sir, uh, on the same broad thing, but then I'm going to pick up the themes yeah. uh, that you just heard from Sue Rudell. What's changed in your situation? You're a person who's been in the, the field a very long time, uh, have a number of companies, work for other companies, What's the difference between, I'm talking about attitude and other things, what's the difference between the beginning of your career and the present moment? 
well, first of all, uh, no interest in politics at all uh, for probably the first 35 years. I've been doing this for 40 years. Um, I echo Sue's comments on the, the technology growth. I'd say we're drilling by far the best wells in our career in the last 10 years. It makes you wonder kind of what we were doing for the first when 30. When you say you're doing <laughs> the best wells, what do you mean? The highest flow rates, uh, highest reserve recovery wells, uh, and it's all driven by technology. It's the shale revolution, if mm -hmm. you like, horizontal multi-phase fracking just opened up uh, an enormous new suite of oil and gas opportunities around the world, and it's delivered cheap energy for the, the whole world. It's delivered cheap energy for Canada, and it's, uh, it's a huge windfall for our country that we're not taking full advantage of uh, at this point in time. Um, our deployment of capital, our efficiencies improved dramatically. Uh, and so we're able to deliver at, at lower and lower costs. And as Sue said, Canada produces the net cleanest hydrocarbon molecule, uh, particularly on the gas side. And it's something we should be proud of. I think you've said many times before, we shouldn't be apologizing for it. How, I'm serious, how come you know, the talk of standards and cleanliness and advanced technology, and don't forget lifting out of poverty. Outside of the oil industry's own own magazines and media thing, that's inside the house. Why isn't it outside to some degree? I mean, well, I'm serious, never mind partisanship. Why wouldn't the government say to the rest of the world, by the way, over here, as opposed to what you've been listening, this is the best, this is the best that's being done. Why doesn't that happen? I don't know. It, it's a massive asset uh, that you know we're squandering. Um, we don't know how to do anything else, so we'll continue doing that, and we'll continue uh, getting better. Um, you know, just borrowing some stats that are publicly available of all the money spent annually on environmental improvement initiatives in all industries, all sectors across Canada. More than fifty percent of it every year is spent by the oil and gas industry. It, it's amazing, and and we're okay with that. Like we, I mean, the part that uh, I think some people lose or people that aren't familiar with our industry is, they know it's centered in Calgary. So there's these oil executives that work in towers, and and they don't maybe they don't care about the environment and so on and so forth. What they don't realize is the people that actually do the work in the field and where the plants are and where the drilling rigs are, they live and raise their families right where we're extracting these hydrocarbons and no one wants to do it better than them because they live there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's what I'm going to ask the two of you. I'll stay with you first. That's the other element that's, that's not fascinated, that's too strong, but has always uh, said something to me. The oil and gas boom in Alberta over the last 20 years that siphoned more people from more provinces to mix together in a common project. I mean, I, I still think of that. The numbers that went, especially from Newfoundland where the fishery had collapsed, the numbers that went over and then New Brunswick here is meeting the guy from Quebec and the guy from up north is meeting the Cape Bretoner and the Calgarians are meeting the Newfoundlanders. I thought, you talk about the bloody multiculturalism, this is action of multiculturalism. I'll go you first on that point and then I'll come to Sue. I think it's a great social thing that was going on. For sure, and you know, it's built all these, these small towns and they have all their own identities and, and they love what they do uh, out in the field and, and they're proud of it and they know that we're producing uh, the cleanest molecules and, and they just want to get better at it uh, all the time. And you know, we want to hire more people <clears throat> right now with our Made in Canada discounts. I mean, we, we aren't running as many drilling rigs as we did yeah. two years ago because we can't. You got to live within cash flow and obviously you got to run your business. Your country doesn't have to run like that apparently, but our businesses have to live within our, our economic means. And so therefore we can't do as much as, as a similar company in the U.S. can do right now Okay, because they back. get world prices. I really want to stress this one. Uh, the Onsans, the Fort McMurray, they were the doom gong for the world. Uh, everyone from, you know, the morons with guitars and other people who float on yachts come up and say that if this project, this is 10 years ago, if this project goes ahead, we're doomed. And then you start listening about the technology and the cleanliness. I play this social card that so many Canadians who otherwise would be either unemployed, yeah. with all the stress that that involves, families would be breaking up, or they're on some sort of government assistance, which for the majority is an embarrassment. Instead, the oil sands projects opened up a whole raft of opportunity 
for a whole lot of people, thousands, yeah. not the executives, the guys under rigs, yeah. the women in the camps. Yeah. And that's just, that's another one. What do you think about that particular dimension? Anyone talk about who works in those things? We talk about it a lot, but uh, we're, we're not just extracting the oil and gas that's there, but uh, the, the oil in the oil sands is actually uh, naturally occurring literally at surface. If we had only thought that really what we were doing is cleaning Clean up, up that whole area, <laughs> it would be a whole different world. But that was my takeaway that day is we are cleaning this up because you can see so vividly the mines and then the yep. reclamation. And it's, it's actually really quite staggering. And not only were we environmentally cleaning it up, we were bringing prosperity to those uh, communities up there that actually... Uh, had never had anything, and, and you, you you were attending to the longest standing and most most durable oil spill in the history of the world. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> had we only really realized that that's what we were doing. You should have at called that yourself time. Greenpeace yeah. and applied for a grant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We may have gotten a grant for it. So. But, uh, but just on you know, again, it's on that yeah. point. When I, I've been up there myself. Yeah. And I, I, I'm coming back to it. I just, you know, Canadians live in our own little silos and Toronto hates this one and all that stuff. But if you're forced, by, I mean, you know, by arbitrary, by circumstance or good luck, and you start meeting people from the other parts of the country, yeah. male and female, newcomer, old comer, and all that stuff, and they have a chance for five or six years, like my guy from Newfoundland you know, makes friends in Edmonton, and his, his daughter, by the way, married someone in Saskatchewan, not in Newfoundland. This is a refreshing of the Confederation. Yeah. Yeah, a huge unifier for the country. Yeah, exactly. And I never, I never hear that talked about. Yeah, it it really is a huge unifier for the country, and I, I think what we're starting to hear talked about now is uh, um, the situation that we're experiencing is potentially driving the country really far apart, and that's alarming to a lot of Albertans and I think a lot of Canadians. How much, and then I'm going to do a view on this one, but first, you, how much uh, of what we hear? of the tensions in Alberta and other and surrounding provinces, by yeah. the way. I've been in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. That over time, this relentless campaign, and it has been, and I'll characterize it as political neglect and a, a lack of opportunities to listen. Uh, you get every, every other cause gets, a, gets, a, gets a, an appearance or a banner. or I haven't heard any federal, uh, it's not anti-liberal, I haven't heard any federal championing of what's going on out there at all. That's exactly So true. how much is that driving and how deep is the drive towards people living in those provinces and what, how much of a danger is it? Yeah, I think it's a big danger actually. It's not, it's not just lack of championing. It's actually people now feeling like it's intentional neglect. It's beyond lack yeah. of championing. Yeah, that's it's a, a different characterization than I've heard. You know, I think it's quite extreme, and, and people are upset, very upset federally, and they're upset that the rest of the Canada, the rest of Canada, doesn't uh, seem to to care about people and the families that are experiencing some of the the, the hard times. You know. Particularly the car manufacturers, you know, six months ago that was in the news. There was a lot of people very angry about how important that was exactly. and how unimportant what well, we're experiencing. Well, I, I just is. want to reinforce your point. We haven't talked before about this. When the couple of steel plants, there were three in together, uh, were announced as being in jeopardy, there were three visits by the Prime Minister to three plants within two days. Exactly. Yeah. You guys have been out sitting on a, on a spike for 10 years. And how many cabinet, cabinet meetings have been held at Ground Center in Fort McMurray? It's a, it's a different scale, and that's what I'm getting at, yeah. that in Alberta people look at this, they're not dumb, and they see the contrast. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw it over to you, this very same question. Yeah, I find this very interesting. It how is, serious is it? It is very serious, and it's a lot different. I actually was working when the first NEP came along, uh, so, but I was a greeny geologist at Shell, so it was more nose down, ass up, make your maps, try and find some. God, what a way to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to censor you on yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> try and find some gas. Is. But, you know, I mean, it, we were a busy company at the time and there were lots of discussions and uh, there are people that I knew then that now 
with what's this relentless hammering down of our industry for, like you say, the last decade, they've changed. And, you know, there is palpable anger and there is separatism out there. And it's a different bunch of people that are talking about it now. And I, I'm a big believer in Canada. We talked, I was yeah. born in Quebec, grew up in Ontario, went out west. My dad was in D-Day, so I think I'm as Canadian yeah. as you can get. And, and so I try and talk them down and just say, well, you know what, let's get through this fall and maybe we can get things changed. But it's more than, I mean, we talk about how you have to be a cheerleader in your office if you're, you know, that's the leadership at the top and you have to pump everyone up and I don't make a very good looking cheerleader and I'm getting kind of tired of doing it. Don't but, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really gone to anger and... Uh, you know, it's something that I warned my two sisters that live in Toronto. I said, you know, a year ago, I said, this is going to get ugly. Yes, and, yeah. and it has. Yeah, I, I heard, I'm back some months from where you are. I heard many times that I've been out there, I, I could feel the crest of it rising. And, and I had some dealings with uh, Premier Wall. And on top, by the way, this is a side point, but I'll come back to the oil and gas. Uh, the, the, the incompetence of our dealing with China now it means that the potash industry is yeah. yet another one being on the yeah. side. I, I'm gonna, this is deliberately provocative, uh, but it's a fair question to ask. Do you think if the majority of the oil sands, as they're still called, uh, were in Ontario, not Quebec, I'm gonna let one make it too sparky, if they were in Ontario and they'd experienced this downturn and they'd had this and that and capital flight and carbon tax and social license, do you think it would be treated differently? Never really thought about that, but uh, it certainly maybe could have been. I don't know. If yeah. you had the auto industry in Alberta and the oil industry in Ontario, which one would be getting the subsidies? Well, I can definitely answer that. It's <laughs> the auto, yeah. auto industry in Ontario because we already experienced that no, one. So. If it was in no, Calgary. Oh, yeah. if it was going the other way around. No, it would be, yeah, you're right. It would yeah. actually be in, uh, in Ontario. And Is I that add one thing I to think it, that though? That's, uh, that's and that's on is, yeah. the environmental zealism yeah. piece of it. I don't think it matters where the oil sands are for that small. For them? No. For them, uh, no. the zealots. Uh, they are against any kind of fossil fuel development. Okay, I'm going to stay with that one. Yeah. Because that's another, that's another reason why some of these things are being done. But at some point, whatever this thing is, it, it left the idea of let's start being cleaner, let's start being more careful. And it got exalted into the idea that the environment, in, in inverted commas, is some transcendental and this is wonderful. And it also became extremely political. Yeah. That the environment, as opposed to let's fix things, and if we do fix them, acknowledge that they've been fixed. Yeah. Uh, but now it becomes a club. And they, say, they pick out, a, and this is a part of the tactic, they pick out an individual company or an individual event and they make that the thing and say, oh, that whole industry is blazingly corrupt. Why are not either people in the industry itself or people in government, why have they been so slack in examining both the motivations and the intensity and the nature of environmental campaigns? There is as much politics as anything else. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, it's, I, I mean, we've already had the discussion on producing the cleanest molecule. I mean, we... Uh, in our industry, or certainly, I mean, our two companies, it's like environmental performance improvement, but it's air, land, and water. And this whole debate and discussion on the environment has, it's just on the atmosphere, and it's just on one molecule in the atmosphere, yeah. which is CO2, yeah. which, you know, we, there's a fairly good, uh, you know, scientific line of thinking that it is kind of a key to life. Too much of anything, just about anything, is probably a, a bad thing. Uh, so we're fine with you know reducing CO2 as well, but it's just horrible risk management. It's like every available environmental dollar yeah. is going to CO2 or carbon, if you like, at the expense of, of all these other things that need to be cleaned up, as you say. It's just, it, we don't run our businesses like that. But, <laughs> but it's also more than that because, yeah. and it, it amounts to the very high billions, if we're talking worldwide, yeah. and possibly trillions, yeah. that if everything is focused on a predetermined understanding of what climate is, then the other possibilities are ignored. But more importantly, most science is an attempt to, to, to negate a thing, to prove that it isn't. In other words, you give it the most rigorous possible test 
to see if you can find something wrong. Mm -hmm. The environmental science is, let's not have any negative tests. Let's, let's say we're all in the same church, and I picked that word deliberately. Yep. All the research money has to go in one direction. All the news media covered in the same way. What do you feel like when you hear over the last five and six years about your industry as it's viewed by the environment, uh, environmentalists and by the media? Oh, uh, anger, frustration. I mean, because as Sue's elucidated, we are getting steadily better and we're reducing all emissions, CO2 included. Uh, and it's, it's very, very frustrating, the, the whole piece. I think that actually ties it back to uh, it doesn't really matter how good we are at everything because the answer is predetermined. You know, it's been set that uh, somehow our government particularly has made the, uh, and, and many governments around the world have actually said there is no such thing as a clean fossil fuel. No. And, you know, can we actually... Keep it in the ground. Yeah, keep it in the ground. And, and really, f fossil fuels are, they're a modern miracle. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, living a, it's a very curious thing. If you read the novels, I made a joke about it earlier, of Dickens or the Sherlock Holmes stories. And I'm just talking about England. Yeah. Uh, right on the crest or the after crest of the Industrial Revolution. Right. And the smog and the, and the coal, especially the coal and all this, and how dirty everything was. And there was no consideration. It's only because of the, the propellant influence of high technology and energy yeah. that has allowed us to transform the instruments to do the building of civilization. And energy is the first thing in them all. Absolutely. Nothing, not the light in this room, nothing happens okay. unless you have oil, gas, and metal. Yeah. And when we in the West, Canada, reach a stage in 2019 when we have, compared to our grandfathers, yeah. Everything in this room is a miracle. And the, the access to knowledge we have via computer, all of this came because capital came out of energy and civilization. And this, this is at the point now where we are the beneficiaries of all this and we want to curse the element that gave it the, to us. Yeah, I don't get gift, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the world needs more and more of all forms of energy. I mean, and we're not trying to disguise <laughs> fossil fuels as not fossil fuels. We're just trying to deliver them ever more, uh, or an ever cleaner hydrocarbon molecule. But we need more of everything. We need more nuclear. Uh, we need more renewables. I think you probably, you know, read some of the recent articles on how, you know, we're getting close to theoretical maximums on the energy you can recover from wind and solar, unless they have some technological mm -hmm. breakthrough that, you know, we experienced 10 batteries, or 12, yeah. 12 years ago. And, and with batteries, you're right. But we need more of everything. And to some extent, we're because we can produce the cheapest, most efficient, cleanest molecule, okay. we're de denying a higher standard of living, or our federal government is, to the developing world. Yeah, you are. I, got, I got one for you as well. <laughs> Over the same period, if, if uh, you project something, meaning you in the oil industry, you project something, or if you have, God forbid, a spill, or some, some poor duck uh, wanders into the wrong pool, you should be more careful. <laughs> Your mistakes get front page. And they get inquiries, and they get 50 states, and all the righteous people of the world uh, collapse. How many times have you heard that the Earth only had 10 months, or 2 months, or 18 months, or the Himalayas are losing their glaciers, or we'll never see snow again, or this is happening here, or, or bees will have shorter wings in six weeks, and people are not getting married because of the globe? How much nonsense, how much nonsense can they say continuously? And how many false projections can they give? And how many alarmist stories can they put out and never get called for it? Yeah. And if you, as I say, if you get Daffy Duck and, and spray him with a bit of oil, you're a criminal. The focus gets on those small, minute little yeah. things, and the big things that can't be proven just no. get to or run Or when wild. you do get yeah. an approval, when you do, and it's always going to be changed, by the way, yeah. Uh, you get 197 conditions attached to it, yeah. and then British Columbia decides that without the jurisdictional right to do so, it's going to throw. Do they ever put conditions on environmental inquiries? Do they ever put the same zeal of scrutiny on the methodology of those who criticize you? Yeah, well that was no. really a little bit, <laughs> but that's a little bit what Bill C-69 was about. Yeah. The, the Senate, we had a, a cross-country um, consultation Hearing. process yep. 
where the Senate actually gathered a lot of information and made recommendations that there would be a standard of what the environmentalists, and not, not necessarily environmentalists, like there's a standard for who can actually intervene. And those are the things that were dismissed. I want you to get on the same point. Uh, well, we've forgotten about the economy uh, through this whole thing. So there's the environmental, you know, zealousness, and then what we're trying to do to respond. But uh, what is being ignored in the whole debate is we need a strong economy in this country, and energy drives it. Uh, and that's what uh, we need. We need better education across the country from our industry. And you know, to some extent, we're late to the game. Uh, we only started getting a lot more. Uh, involved in advoc advocacy in the last four or five years, um, we need to explain how integral to everyone's life uh, Canadian fossil fuels are for, for Canadians. Yeah. And it's the economy and it's what you do on your everyday life. And I think there's a lot of people, they say, yeah, well, you know, energy, that's gasoline for my car. And they think electricity just comes from the wall and it's clean. And, you know, of course, you know that, you know, it, it could come from a variety of sources. Most of them are probably fossil fuels. And that's part of the education process that we've just got to keep hammering away on yeah. and continue to do our job better because we have I'm no gonna choice I'm going to go back that. to it. <coughs> this is a political point, but you hear it. Uh, the present Liberal government, I think it's actually a green NDP government myself. That's yeah. personal. Us too. And I, I've put them reversed. Actually, further left oh. than the green is where Very, I put yeah. them, yeah. So you have... Greener the, than the green. <laughs> yeah, well, you have the principal advisor is a veteran uh, leader of the very environmental movement that has, and this is not a metaphor, demonized, demonized oil and gas. He was also the, the chief <coughs> policy advisor under two previous NDP governments in uh, liberal governments <coughs> in Ontario. You've got Mr. Trudeau, uh, uh, who is basically kind of a new age understanding uh, of the environment and a great uh, exhibitionistic concern for all things. In the con and that's, that's a, I think, a, a fair description. In the face of all of that, where, where does the provinces who have industries and have other, um, or minerals, that do they not understand that this government is probably ac actively hostile to them? Well, they are actively uh, hostile to our industry. I think the aforementioned advisor has more than once in Calgary said, I am going to phase your industry out. Uh, and so that is a little disturbing if you, you work in the industry when we know how much we need what our industry delivers to the, the rest of the country. And how much the country actually needs uh, yeah. what we're delivering. You know, if you look at economically how our country is performing right now, um, the, the depression, effectively, that mm -hmm. Alberta and Saskatchewan are experiencing is, uh, is actually influencing Canadians' uh, livelihoods. Of course it is. Yeah, and, and it's, um, it's very palpable, obviously, where we are. It's less palpable here, but it, it's across the board. It's very palpable yeah. back in Newfoundland. Yes, uh, yeah. Everything from... The restaurants closing, the office space is no longer filled up, the few companies that are left are consolidating what office space they have. Yeah. Uh, all of the trickle across when, the, when the, the men and women out there were sending money home. Yeah. Uh, it ain't there anymore. No, it's... No, and, it, and we've talked about young people and you were talking about young yeah. women coming into the industry, but just young males and females, we, we've worked really hard to attract new young grads. We need to hire young, smart people and they... They do seem okay. to be smarter than we were when we started. And with this kind of extended downturn slash depression, I'm worried about losing those people that are kind of between 25 and 35 who the are really should, smart the should be and worried really about good. Them. And yeah. and it breaks your heart. I mean, when I started at Shell back in 1979, I think they hired 24 BSCs. I was one of them just into exploration. That doesn't even talk about the engineering functions. And now there are like literally hundreds of you know, fantastic engineering and geology and various other technical discipline grads that don't get jobs. They go off to the states and Mexico and yeah. Africa, or, or or they're not working. Or they're not in, working in at they, all. I know, and and we could be such a driver of that, and it'd be such a young, vibrant industry. It, it does break your heart, actually. I want to go yeah. one more uh, on a purely political one. Um, 
we've got a sketch of where the current government is. Where's, where's the loud voice and uh, extreme defense from Andrew Scheer? Where's the national policy statement about where he is on this? When he made his environmental plan free, he was standing in, in front of a lake like, like it was a Disney movie. Uh, I had the thought he should be up in, in Fort McMurray make the stand. Yeah. Where's he? Is he any better? I think he is better. Like we've heard uh, how he's thinking more holistically about uh, energy as an and in the economy, not a, you know, fossil fuels are not an or in his world. They're an and and, and uh, you know, the economy and the environment can coexist. And so his... That's very much Catherine McKenna. They go well, hand in hand. Yeah, her words and her actions are very different, actually. Uh, the policies that she's endorsing are not um, endorsing an and no. solution at all. You know, back to where we started in our conversation yeah. about innovation and, and technology, uh, it's presupposing answers, and everyone knows that you can never. Um, decide where technology breakthroughs are going to come from. Can't. Yeah, you, you, if you presuppose the answers, you'll, uh, you know, you'll not get the best out there. You'll, and, and that's, I, I feel like that's what's happened to uh, the oil and gas industry. Also, if you foreclose uh, the, 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 the subject that you're investigating, that it has to be this, and if you foreclose all other possible avenues of exploration of what might else be, then this science uh, is corrupt. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'd like to put the same to you on Mr. Shear, though. Sure. There is a division. Uh, anyone who's around the industry, I, I'll speak clearly on this, knows that since the depression in world prices, uh, the flight of capital from Alberta, the number of companies who have either moved headquarters or, or gone down a fair bit, the fire at Fort McMurray, the flood in Fort McMurray, and the imposition of carbon taxes on an already mortified industry. Mm -hmm. it's I, would made us I would expect more from the leader of the opposition than I've heard. Yeah, I, I'd agree with it. I think it's how he delivers um, the message. I mean, we've been to, we don't know him. We've been to a couple of, of Q&As. And, you know, as Sue said, he's actually really good in those Q&As and he says the right things. And maybe he just doesn't deliver it forcefully enough. Like he has said, if we're elected, Bill C-69, C-48 are gone. If we're elected, there won't be carbon taxes in their current form. And, and I, I do believe, uh, believe him when he says this, but it, it hasn't come across, you know, maybe he's not as hard hitting perhaps as, as Jason Kenney is in, in delivering the message, but he is saying okay. the right things. Okay. So, and that at this point in time, okay. he's just not the same animal as some of the other politicians perhaps. Okay, then just, yeah. just to round things off, I started asking both of you, you know, how things have changed over the period. And that we've gone into some, some, there's a whole lot more, some of it. If you first, if, if you were to divine uh, a message uh, or a description of what things should be for the Canadian Western oil and gas industry at this moment, any area you want, what would the, the message or theme be? Well, the overriding theme would be, and it, it's one that we use, uh, is the world needs more Canada. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd say that's the overriding one. What does that mean? We should be developing as much of the future, current and future uh, hydrocarbon needs of the whole world in Canada because we deliver the cleanest molecule. That way we're attacking the 98.5% of emissions that happen outside this country that's the target if you want to improve mm -hmm. uh, the, the global atmosphere. Um, implicit in that is that we would build probably two or three gas pipelines to the west coast. We'd have two more oil pipelines to the west coast. We'd build that Energy East pipeline so yeah. Canada actually could truly be uh, oil uh, self-sufficient. So the implication in that is that's hundreds of thousands of jobs. And then to fill those pipelines, then you have a very okay. robust drilling completion industry. Like one two BCF uh, LNG project on the West Coast generates just in drilling and completion activity, if you assume it's a 20 year project and they'll go longer than that, uh, is $22 billion of drilling completion activity. And that you know ripples across the whole country. So the steel mills have to build the tubulars for those, those wells and, and so forth. And then the standard of living of all 
Canadians improves because there's that much more capital uh, uh, available for all the social programs we need with a, an increasing population. So it's a hat trick, uh, those three things. Yeah. And, and that's the game, that's the game we should be in. A man with a way for metaphors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your goal. Right. Uh, you know, one of the, the signs that you often see um, held up in, in gets captured by the media is uh, climate leaders don't build pipelines. Uh, and that is a fallacy. Climate leaders do build pipelines because climate leaders get the cleanest yes. molecule to uh, to the rest of the globe so that that's what can be being used. My summary comment on this is that the what is what is described as an environmental war against the oil sands is not primarily environmental at all. It is political and ideological more than it is concerned with the future of the planet. Absolutely. But you two are extremely patient and it's very good to see two people who actually agree with each other and have been in, have <laughs> yeah. been in sudden conduct for so long. Yeah. Thank you and thank you. And thank Thanks, you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All we needed was roast beef and gravy and we could call this a meal. Yeah. <laughs>